Welcome to Bitcoin Fixes This, where we explore the impact that Bitcoin will have in all aspects of society. Today's guest is Jason Larry, member of the Space Force, currently studying at MIT. We talk about the Space Force, his theories of military combat, and why he thinks Bitcoin is an alternative. We go into the topic of power projection in depth. This is the longest podcast I've ever recorded, so please enjoy. Jason Larry, how's everything going, man? It's going great, Jimmy. <laughs> well, where are you at right now? I am sitting in my office in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I just How are things over there? It's busy. It's uh, cold. It's just uh-huh. we just had our first snow. <laughs> and it's currently finals week. Mm. And I am notably not studying for those finals. <laughs> <laughs> And you can get away with this because what? <laughs> yeah. No, I've luckily it's not too bad for me. We did most of our, we don't have too many finals and we did most of our front loading already. So I've got a pretty easy week ahead of me. It's not too bad compared to the poor undergraduates here. <laughs> well, how has it been like at a university setting, like, uh, you know, with COVID and everything else? MIT's got it down really well. Obviously, they have like, you know, tech savvy people here. So the way we have it set up is everyone has an app. You're not allowed into the school or through any of the doors unless your app says you've been successfully tested within the time frame. We get tested twice a week. We get this little vial that we stick up our nose and scan a barcode and our test our positive testing rate right now at the institute last time i checked was 0.25 percent which is well below the average in both the city and the state Mm -hmm. and so i mean it's really just their methodology was just test like crazy and (laughs) if if someone pops positive then most of the classrooms have live streaming available so you can just watch from home if you if you test positive i see so you don't actually have to go to class at all (laughs) if you wanted to you could just pop positive over and over and over again Uh, but that would be uh yeah that wouldn't be fun i don't think it's way more rewarding to be in class if you're going to be in the city if you're going to be paying the cost of living here you might as well be in person And then at least in Cambridge and Boston, we still have the mask mandate. So everyone's Mm. all PPE'd up in class. Mm. That must kind of be unfortunate that, uh, you know, not getting to see people's faces (laughs) even when you're meeting them. It's weird to like talk to people for like, you know, three months. And then (laughs) like we did one class over Zoom just because we needed to like demo a piece of software and it was easier to do it over Zoom. And like for half the class, I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that guy had a mustache. (laughs) I had no idea. That's what, you know, his mouth looked like. (laughs) Yeah. Or like what that person looked like, period. Because it's one of the identifying things, right? Fortunately, the the rules allow the professors or any speaker to Mm -hmm. not wear their mask. Mm. And so I at least know what my the lecturer looks like, and I can pick up on those, you know, vital clues, <laughs> you know, those nonverbal. <laughs> That's so crazy that colleges have gone through these things, and it must be a very different experience from what I gather. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely different. I'm still thankful, though, because like last year, you know, they didn't even have in-person lectures at all they stopped them completely and it was zoom only. Mm. And that would have just been, I would have hated that. Mm. Luckily I got in during the first semester where they came back into person. Mm. Well, all right. So speaking of your education and things like that, you are there as a grad student. Can you tell us the story of like how you got there? What made you go to MIT as a grad student? And, you know, there's obviously a backstory there. Uh, Tell us more about it. Sure. So I am an active duty military officer in the Space Force. Mm -hmm. And for military officers especially, people are surprised to learn that we spend a good, probably about third of our career in school of all different kinds, either training or academics. So 
the U.S. military is really big on making sure that the officers that are essentially wielding violence on behalf of the public are super as well educated as they could possibly make them. And so to that end, the military will send people to different schools and all throughout their career. And so I'm halfway through my 20 year career. I've been in since 2010, into 2010. So I guess that makes me 11 years now. And so for officers in the Department of the Air Force, when you hit your halfway mark, they send you back to school, of course. <laughs> and you go to grad school. And most of the time, most officers get sent to, at least in the Air Force, what they call the Air Command and Staff College or mm -hmm. some other military college. They're still accredited degrees, but they're just run by different military services. Mm -hmm. But a couple of them are sent to different universities across the country, different civilian universities. And so mm -hmm. the Department of the Air Force specifically picks at, uh, one or two engineers and sends them to MIT for grad school halfway through their career. Mm. And I was lucky enough to get picked for that. And so I am the, uh, it's called, there's a, there's a name for it. It's called the, there's Department of the Air Force Fellows, but also there's uh, National Defense Fellowship. And so mm. I'm part of the U.S. National Defense Fellowship. I'm a U.S. National Defense Fellow. They pay me to go to school, which is like probably the best job in the military. And yeah, so I've been at MIT for over a little over half a year now. Mm -hmm. I should graduate sometime around early 2023, early to mid 2023. Mm -hmm. And I'll get my degree in engineering and management. And then I'll go back to the Department of the Air Force and uh, use that degree, hopefully to their benefit. It's cool because I'm the first Space Force fellow Mm -hmm. which is neat and there's not a second one mm. so far that hasn't has been picked so like i'm the token space force guy everywhere i go in <laughs> class which is uh funny i try to wear as many meme shirts as i can to class <laughs> <laughs> well so i don't know how many people actually know that much about the space force so can you tell us a little bit more about what the mission is and you know why why you know the air force sort of has this you know, subsection that, that does space stuff. Yeah. I guess the just big picture, a lot of people get uh, confused through the government bureaucracy, understandably, mm -hmm. and they forget like the purpose of, it's a subtle distinction. The purpose of the army is not to fight. The purpose mm -hmm. of the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force is not to fight. These are government agencies that exist to organize, train, and equip people to present to a combatant command. And then the combatant command, the purpose of the combatant command is to fight. Mm. And so these military departments exist to present forces to combatant commands for the purpose of fighting. And mm. so what happened over the last, I guess, two years, Mm. is that the United States realized that we need to start designating space as a no kidding combatant command. So mm. everything higher than an altitude of, I think it's a thousand kilometers, is mm. now technically considered a geographic combatant domain. Mm. This was not a choice that we got to make, unfortunately. This was kind of made by other people. And specifically the Chinas and the Russias, they kind mm. of basically said it's fair game. Mm. And so we created something called U.S. Space Command, mm. designated it a geographic combatant command, and said essentially everything above 1,000 kilometers to infinity is now like a warfighting domain. Mm. The problem then became, okay, so we have this new combatant command, which military branch is going to organize, train, and equip forces to present to that combatant command. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the space stuff was nested under the Air Force. Mm -hmm. But we, we learned that we needed our own, basically our own silo of money and, and uh, representatives, similar to how the Marines operate, right? Like mm -hmm. the Marines are 
technically within the Department of the Navy. Mm. But the job of a Marine is distinctly different than like a sailor, right? Mm. And so we basically learned, okay, we should probably have a Space Force who's distinct from the Department of the Air Force in the same way that the Na- that the Marines are distinct from the Department of the Navy, whose job it is to organize, train, and equip new military forces for the purpose of presenting them to not only U.S. Space Command, but also to other combatant commands as well who might need space effects to benefit their terrestrial warfighting. And so it was kind of a bureaucratic move, but it was needed, I think. And so then basically people in the different military services were able to opt into joint, basically like retiring from their current military service and intra-service transferring into the Space Force. So I was part of the, I'm part of like the first cadre of officers to join the Space Force, which made sense because I was doing the spacey stuff in the Air Force. Mm. I see. So, all right. So I think I have the structure roughly down. You have the Air Force, you have the Navy, you have the Army, and they train and equip essentially soldiers for the combatant command. Can you tell me a little bit more about who the combatant commanders are or like what they are? I'm I'm guessing they're officers or something. What's the actual thing? They're like, they're imagine like four-star generals who are in charge of overseeing all military operations within a certain region. So for Mm. example, what we would call um, Pacific Command, right? You can Mm. imagine what their, what's called AOR, their area of responsibility is. It's Mm. the Pacific area. You've got CENTCOM, for example. Mm. You've got a whole bunch of different combatant commands. And and some of them are kind of weird. Like you've got TRANSCOM. So that is kind of like, that's like transportation. It's kind of everything around the globe, just because it's not, it doesn't have a distinct geographic area. And Mm. then you've even got like other, what they call functional combatant commands. For Mm. example, there's a strategic command, a STRATCOM, as we call it. And so that's like your nukes, you know, Mm. these are your big picture functions that need their own bureaucratic structure essentially to be responsible for those and so each of these combatant commanders they are the ones that like technically hold the power to fight like they're the ones delegated by the president by the SecDef to be responsible for fighting and they have the power to tell the military branches what they need in order to win the fight in their specific area of responsibility. And it's, it's a small distinction. It's a subtle distinction for most people. It means nothing because at the end of the day, these are still like generals wearing military uniforms, mm. right? Mm. But to how the money flows, how the structures work, it is a big difference. And, and once you understand that difference, the Space Force makes a little bit more sense. Basically, like our combatant commanders, for example, in in Central Command, right? There's the headquarters is in a place called Al Udeid Air Base in a country called Qatar, mm. and you know he'll be responsible for, but like pretty much the whole Middle East. They might have a problem where you know their satellite communications aren't working or their GPS isn't working because. Mm someone in Iran or somewhere else is jamming it mm. or, you know, their people in, you know, indo pacom or Pacific area, mm. their carrier battle groups not might not be able to, you know, get their precision navigation and timing that they need from GPS to get their satellite communications that they need. So how does that combatant commander tell or get support for those types of issues? They didn't really have that structure. It just Mm. wasn't in the kind of chain of command. It wasn't in the bureaucracy. So now that Space Force exists, we exist to kind of solve those problems. If the stuff you need to do your operations involves space and Mm. that gets disrupted, the Space Force is here to try to figure out how to fix that or make that structure more defendable or punch back, organize, train, and equip people to punch back if they need to. Mm. 
Well, it kind of reminds me of how the Air Force actually started with, you know, like initially it was flyovers to see sort of like enemy, you know, formations from the sky. And that in turn led to the air fighting. And then, you know, like eventually it became its whole own thing because of the ability to drop bombs and stuff like that. It sounds like Space Force is kind of starting there where you can get reconnaissance and all sorts of nice information from space using, you know, GPS and stuff like that, or, you know, comm stuff, I guess. But, you know, at some point, like there's going to, in some, any sort of conflict, you might get, you know, fighting in that area. Is that what Space Force is specifically for? I think that's a good way to think about it. If you study how air power started, it's a really fascinating, it says a lot about how humans operate and mm -hmm. kind of the nature of technology emerging mm -hmm. and how it gets eventually weaponized if it's powerful enough. And so, you know, around the turn of the century, 1900, we're starting to see these flying machines, people who have spent their entire lives fighting right? Studying military combat have never seen anything like this capability. M many times, the first airplanes were discredited as being useful for warfare. So like one of the best examples is the highest ranking person in World War I, mm. a dude named Foch, I think that's mm -hmm. how you pronounce it, Ferdinand Foch. Mm -hmm. When he first saw airplanes a couple of years earlier, he's quoted as saying, airplanes are interesting toys, but are of no military value whatsoever. Mm. <laughs> and like, you see this often with new technology. I could talk for hours uh, stories about prominent military leaders discrediting emerging new technology and then getting burned by them, right? Mm -hmm. But this was like a common thing. Most people, when they saw this emerging technology discredited, it, it was clunky, like when an army officer took mm. their first ride in a Wilbur or it was either Wilbur mm. or Orville took mm -hmm. their first ride with one of the Wright brothers in an airplane, it crashed and the guy mm. died. Mm. Like the officer, like the attache, he was like out there to evaluate this new technology potential died. <laughs> <laughs> As, so like, you know, let's just say that airplanes were discredited for a while. There were a couple people in the army who were screaming their heads off about, or maybe it was, yeah, I think it was the army, about how important this new technology would be, specifically against like battleships, right? Battleships were the heyday back then. Mm -hmm. And this dude was named Billy Mitchell, and we study him a lot. He's kind of like a hero in the Department of the Air Force. Mm -hmm. This guy's named Billy Mitchell. He's talking about how airplanes really tilt the calculus and create an asymmetric return on investment. He's saying like with one cheapo airplane, I can sink a huge battleship mm -hmm. and he would actually like demo it. He took an airplane, put a bomb on it, a mm -hmm. makeshift torpedo. He flew a single airplane with a single torpedo or some number of them. And it sank a captured German battleship that we had to demonstrate mm -hmm. it. It was a demonstration of capability. And he was like known for just constantly bashing the people in the military, but more importantly, like the congressional people who would like fund the military. And he was just like, he kept on saying like, we're putting way too much money resources into ships, to battleships. We should really start looking into this whole airplane thing because I think it's going to be the main show. He essentially got demoted mm -hmm. from a general back down to a colonel because of how insubordinate he was <laughs> like there's one quote of him basically calling his bosses like pigs like swine they're like dumb mm -hmm. as pigs if they because mm -hmm. they don't recognize you know the emerging technology of these airplanes and mm -hmm. then of course what happens pearl harbor happens mm -hmm. and he was proven right and after he died he got his star back like the congressional mm -hmm. people decided okay he should get a star back. He was totally right about this new technology. And, and so this happens a lot. And so we get into this situation recently. You see it all, it happens with like virtually every technology. You could talk, you could say the same story when people who spent their entire lives learning how to do equestrian cavalry saw their first tanks. 
Mm. I could tell you a story about Emperor Constantine Mm -hmm. and when he saw the first cannon, Mm -hmm. a year after turning down the guy who offered to build the first cannon for him, right? Mm -hmm. Like you get to fast forward to 2010 Mm -hmm. to 2020, we get into this world where we're starting to see people are starting to learn like a, a good way to disrupt the terrestrial war fight is to point the gun at the satellite in space that is enabling all these terrestrial war fights. Mm. Like there's a lot of stuff in space uh, that exists exclusively to support combat operations. We have, like I said before, GPS, we've got satellite communications. We've got satellites in space whose sole job is to watch for missile launches and once the missile launches, the satellites will calculate where it's going and mm. then warn whoever it's going towards to take cover. Like when uh, mm. Iran shot those missiles at a couple people in, in a forward operating base, I think it was in like 2019 or yeah, you know, our satellite systems were basically calling those bases and telling them, take cover, you've got a missile strike inbound, you have eight minutes before it hits. Hmm. And so like, or for example, you know, everyone knows, like, can have that image of like the officer carrying the football around, Mm -hmm. right, for the president and the president's got his launch codes. And if he needs to, he can call in a strike. There is an entire dedicated satellite constellation, a nuclear SATCOM constellation intended explicitly to preserve communications in the event of a nuclear strike to always enable the president to be able to call in a strike if he needs to. So if you want to like be disruptive towards mm-hmm. our systems, point the gun at that satellite, right? Mm-hmm. Then you can cause, uh, you know, once again, we get into this thing where we have effectively battleships in space and people are learning that like, if you want an asymmetric return on investment, blow up the thing in space mm-hmm. uh, to cripple the people on the ground. And so, You know, the people in the Department of the Air Force that saw this threat clearly were advocating for it for a long time. It was a conversation that was happening a lot, but eventually it got so severe that people realized, okay, we're about to have our another Billy Mitchell moment if we don't Mm. don't take care of this. So we created an entire new military branch Mm. and we didn't need a Pearl Harbor to do it, if that makes Mm. sense. Mm. I see. Well, what is it like to like try to take down a satellite in space? Because like, how do you even get weapons up there? Like, what do you have to do to sort of like combat things so that, you know, you're disrupting your enemy or protecting your own stuff? What does that even look like? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously it's like pretty new, so we don't really know yet what it'll shape out to be. But Mm -hmm. there are a couple of things that have happened that Mm -hmm. are like, you know, for example, the U.S. used a, I think it was an Aegis missile shot off mm-hmm. of a destroyer mm-hmm. to shoot down a tumbling satellite and blow it up. And so, like, you can shoot down satellites just from, like, using your good old-fashioned missiles that you shoot at, like, airplanes or shoot at other ships. Mm. But you can only reach the satellites that are super low to the ground. It's called low-Earth mm. orbit. Mm. So, you know, they're not very high up. India Mm. has demonstrated a capability to do this. China has done this. Russia just did it a couple weeks ago. So they blew Mm. up a satellite in low Earth orbit. The problem with doing that is you create a bunch of debris and -hmm. it stays in orbit. So you actually like cause incredible damage to civilization Mm. by filling the, you know, filling our precious orbits with particles that can harm people. In fact, Mm like astronauts were taking cover. They actually had to like emergency get into their capsules a couple weeks ago because there was so much debris in space that's going to now stay in space for years, if Mm -hmm. not decades, if not centuries, because Russia decided to shoot down that satellite in that way. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, a war in space would be really similar to like a nuclear war. It would be devastating to Mm -hmm. humanity it would be a war without winners. So the goal, at least on the U.S. side, is to do whatever we can to deter from anyone from even like trying to do that. Like we want to just make it clear that like you have basically nothing to gain from trying that. And there's, you know, obviously like it would probably be something similar to what exists on the ground today. Today, Mm. you know, if 
like I can imagine a world like right now, if you shoot a missile at a an airplane, at a fighter airplane specifically, mm-hmm. there's something on the tail of the plane called a radar warning receiver that will know that it's being targeted by like an RF missile seeker or a radio frequency missile seeker. It'll basically know that a missile's coming at it. Mm. And you see that in the movies where like the sirens go off. It's like beep beep beep, beep. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're targeted inbound, uh-huh. right? And what happens then is a lot of stuff happens. The pilot can, you know, maneuver, right? So maybe mm. satellites can learn how to maneuver out of the way of incoming whatever. The planes, most planes have something called chaff and flare systems. They like mm. poop out strands of metal that are designed to basically sparkle and glint and confuse the radio frequency uh, seeker inside of the missile so it like follows the wrong thing it's kind of like you know how like a squid will ink and then fly away it Mm -hmm. creates like a cloud of ink and then flies away Mm -hmm. well when you can't see through ink the reason why you can't see through ink is because light itself is electromagnetic radiation our eyes are tuned to see a very specific frequency of electromagnetic radiation ink is tuned to block the frequencies from view, right? It could be clear, but it's not. The reason why it's not clear is because most animals see this very specific band of electromagnetic radiation, which we call light. Mm -hmm. And so like it's designed explicitly to make animals not be able to see it. So you can do the same thing for all frequencies using things like chaff, using things like flare. What is flare? Flare is probably something like magnesium, something really hot so that Mm -hmm. a heat-seeking missile will go after the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. It'll turn. And then you can do all kinds of like interesting electronic warfare tricks. You you see like the Russians, you see Israelis, you see it also in the United States. Basically all like modern day countries have pretty cool, pretty clever electro warfare countermeasures designed to like basically trick the missile into chasing a false target Mm. and so like if that works in air then i can see something like that working in space too there's you know directed energy weapons right Mm. you can like laze you can fry the focal plane of an optic by lazing it and effectively Mm -hmm. make it that camera whatever useless you can do Mm -hmm. reversible attacks you can do non-reversible attacks you can grab onto a satellite if you wanted to and like mm-hmm. like take it away if you if you needed to. Like <laughs> there's all kinds, of, you know, th- that's the cool thing, I guess, about being the, you know, like me, an engineer in the Space Force is these are the kinds of questions that we have to start asking ourselves. What is responsible deterrence in space? What would be responsible ways to prevent our satellite systems from being attacked? How can we design our satellite constellations to be more defendable against these new emerging types of attack? And if absolutely necessary, how do we punch back if we need to in a responsible way? Mm. Well, what I find fascinating about sort of this fight in space is exactly what you said. The stuff stays in orbit. And also the amount of energy required to get, say, a missile, or I guess a laser is a little different because it's just like directed light, it is actually very costly, right? Like to actually even get a missile up to the, you know, I guess higher orbits that most satellites uh, take up. Like, how do you make sure that you can do that? Because that's got to be an enormous engineering feat, even getting you know, the satellites up there is a big engineering feat in in of itself to get a missile up there and then to direct it to something else has got to be extremely difficult. Yeah, it's definitely challenging. It's interesting. Like when we were first launching stuff, what are rockets? Rockets are just repurposed missiles essentially, right? Mm -hmm. So when we were first launching stuff in orbit, specifically military satellite systems or intelligence and surveillance and reconnaissance satellite systems, because it was so expensive to get them into orbit, because it just takes so much energy and so much engineering to do it, you would have to, there tended to be like, basically we tended to build big satellites with a lot of exquisite capability on it. Mm -hmm. you know a lot of doohickeys 
and then we put those in space because it's just so expensive to get any mass in space. You might like you just like load as much as you can on this one thing, so you don't mm. have to constantly like launch a bu whole bunch of rockets because it's so expensive. Mm. The problem with that, the emergent effect of that, is we created a bunch of big, fat, juicy targets in space, <laughs> right? And so, and so you know, a clever opponent would see that opportunity and say, "Hey, you know, I can." There's a big, fat, juicy target in space. But what's cool is like right now, I guess right now, the cost of space lift itself is declining rapidly, right? With mm. the advent of, you know, like renewable rockets or, you know, like Falcons, right? That can land themselves and launch, I think like seven times, right? I don't know what the limit is right now. I don't know what the record is, but SpaceX is doing some cool stuff. But ditto for small lift. Mm -hmm. You'll notice there's a huge commercial space race going on right now with just like small rockets getting little single satellites up there. Mm -hmm. Or you'll notice that with the advent of like better technology, you can poop out like a whole bunch of what are called mega constellations like Starlink, right? Mm -hmm. So like you can just send one rocket and send out 60 satellites that have, you know, pretty, pretty good capability. And so as the cost of space lift decreases and mm -hmm. as the cost of technology just decreases, mm -hmm. then you'll see it gets easier and easier and easier to play that what is effectively a game of battle bots in space to get stuff <laughs> into orbit and to, you know, battle bot it up there if it comes to that. Mm. So there are clearly a lot of costs to getting something heavy up there. But, you know, I mean, we've all seen those like YouTube videos where you know, they'll take like a large helium balloon and like attach a camera to it or something like that. And you can actually get into like low earth orbit almost, right? Like with just that, like, yeah. why can't you do something like that? And I don't know, like, That's a I'm, good I'm just point. wondering. There are two very different ways to get to what we would call the space combatant command, right? Mm -hmm. Remember it's, let's say a thousand kilometers above earth. Mm -hmm. I can go straight up. I can send mm -hmm. a missile straight up, but mm -hmm. that missile is coming back down. I can send <laughs> a balloon straight up, but that missile is coming back down. To, mm -hmm. to achieve orbit means you have to go so fast parallel to the surface of the Earth mm -hmm. that you fall, like the rate at which you fall is right. faster than the rate at which you go sideways so that you actually never return back down to earth. Orbit is just a, is crazy cool physics. Mm. You are falling, mm -hmm. but you are falling while moving so far to, you know, along the surface of the earth, along the direction of the surface of the earth that you fall forever and you never actually make it back to earth. That's mm -hmm. in the same way like all things in space are essentially in free fall. Mm -hmm. It's like trippy. And so the energy required to get a thousand kilometers above the ground is easy. You see, you know, Jeff Bezos and his rich friends can send a rocket up that high and it's not too hard. You, the size of the rocket is tiny compared to like, compare the size of like a Blue Origin rocket to a Falcon 9. Mm. You know, there is no comparison. It, it takes way more energy, way more fuel to gain the speed necessary to achieve orbit. It's something around like 17,000 miles an hour. Mm. And so, you know, if I want to shoot down something, I don't have to go into orbit to shoot it down. Mm. But if I don't want to cause a big mess or if I want to be clever, yeah, I would have to get to orbit. So the energy required to do those two very different things are quite different. Mm. So you'll see... Elon Musk make the distinction that he has the first reusable orbital rocket mm -hmm. because, you know, there's for the physicists and the engineers out there, they appreciate the step function increase in difficulty required to get something into orbit. Mm. So it's significantly more difficult to get something into orbit versus just getting something up there, period. Right. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Well, so that's very interesting that you have these different things. And you mentioned before that China and Russia sort of like forced the formation of the Space Force. Can you talk a little bit more about what happened there sort of geopolitically to get the Space Force to form? Yeah. Space is weird. 
it's very different than traditional battlegrounds. Mm. For example, like there is no distinction in space between offense and defense because no one owns any part of space, for example. Mm. So, for example, like run this run this thought experiment. If China, Russia, Stan, China, Russia, Iranistan put a hypersonic nuclear warhead into orbit around the moon, into mm-hmm. a parking orbit around the moon, would that be an offensive or defensive action? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's unclear, right? <laughs> Let's say the United States launched something to blow up that hypersonic nuclear warhead that's parked in a orbit around the moon. Hmm. Is that an offensive or a defensive action? I would think it's defensive, but I don't know. It's it's hard to tell. Uh-huh. There's the definition between offensive and defensive is really just what nation you're working for, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. This is true for all orbits. It's true for everything in space. And unlike the ground, you're moving it at least 17,000 miles an hour all the time. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're, you have hang time over all parts of the country. It's just confusing. Mm. And a lot of technologies that would appear to be, quote, scientific, double as offensive or defensive capabilities, double as Mm -hmm. power projection capabilities. And so what we started to see is we started to see the Russians, we started to see the Chinese launching, quote, scientific experiments. Mm. But these scientific experiments look exactly like all those things we talked about before, right? (laughs) Like, why are you testing your ability to fly close rendezvous proximity operations around another satellite? Why do you have these intricate like robotic arms that are pulling solar panels that Mm -hmm. can pull solar right why are you there was a there was one russian satellite we we call it the kamikaze Mm -hmm. but uh i don't remember the actual name of it but it was quote a scientific experiment and Mm -hmm. it was basically a russian nesting doll satellite so it would fly around and then it would like poop out or give birth to a baby satellite Mm mm-hmm and then like drop it off and then that satellite would poop out or give birth to another baby satellite Mm -hmm. and then that baby satellite could shoot a little small projectile and those baby satellites started flying awfully close to you know the american battleships in space we'll say Mm -hmm. and so is that a scientific experiment is that an offensive action is that a defensive action Mm. i don't know but if I were developing weapons in space, it would look an awfully lot like that, right? <laughs> and so, you know, when I first joined, this was all like, we couldn't talk about this, but now mm-hmm. we can. It's all out in the open now, and you can read mm-hmm. about it, and you can read about, you can read from our generals who describe all kinds of situations like this, where you'll see Russian satellites come in super hot, fly super close, way mm-hmm. too danger close to major military or intelligence surveillance reconnaissance satellites and then fly away Mm. i kind of do these harassment techniques like on the ground if a jet is if a russian jet is scrambled and does like some type of aggressive maneuver against a plane or if like a russian or chinese warship sailed super close to an american warship this would make national news it would be clear that this is like some type of possible military maneuver or mm. message. Mm-hmm. The public, unfortunately, isn't aware right now of what we have, how important it is, how vulnerable it is, and what goes on. Mm. Most people don't even know that American astronauts were taking cover in the ISS because there was so much debris two weeks ago mm. from a Russian mm. missile that shot down on satellites. So, yeah, this started emerging, emerging, and finally – it became like uh, some of it became public. It was a conversation that was started long before the POTUS made it a meme. And so I think that's part of also the confusion is, is they focus more on the meme than the, what's going <laughs> you know, what's going on. And, and you know, I'll be the first to admit, I, I wear those meme shirts all the time. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> that's awesome. 
Well, so you have uh, all these satellites that are in space, and it sounds like at least some of them have some maneuverability and ability to sort of like, I don't know, move around and do different things, which satellites do. But my impression of anything in space is that it just takes a lot of energy to do almost anything. So how are they able to kind of do what they're doing, if that makes sense? Yeah. Some orbital maneuvers are way cheaper than others. Mm. If you go into orbit and you want to change your inclination, it's mm -hmm. like how diagonal your orbit looks compared to the equator, basically. Mm -hmm. That is an extremely expensive maneuver. You like, there's a game, video game called Kerbal Space Program. Mm -hmm. It's corny, but it's ex it's really good at teaching people like the basics of two body orbital dynamics. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because you have like these little clown characters that you know you basically accidentally kill because you crash your space system. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many Kerbals, how many of these clown people I've accidentally killed because I tried to do an inclination change and didn't have mm -hmm. enough fuel, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's the same in like real space. The, the inclination changes are so expensive that like we have two completely different launch pads. We mm. have one on the East Coast, what everyone's familiar with, like Cape Canaveral. You've probably heard of it. Mm -hmm. That pad exists to shoot low inclination satellites into space. So mm -hmm. orbits that are pretty close to like equatorial. Mm -hmm. But if we need polar orbits... Mm -hmm. Right, orbits that fly around both poles of the Earth. We use a completely different launch pad. We use the West Coast. We use Vandenberg Space Force to do that. That's where I mm -hmm. used to work. Mm -hmm. And so, like, if you know from the very start, you aim at the inclination, and if you need to change your inclination later, you're basically SOL because <laughs> it's too expensive. But for other stuff like changing your altitude, it's actually really mm -hmm. easy. Mm -hmm. And the way that orbit Total mechanics works is if you lower yourself in altitude, then mm -hmm. you travel closer to you travel faster relative to the surface of the Earth, mm -hmm. and so you can get from one side of the Earth to the other side for super cheap with just a little bit of fuel to burn a little retrograde to drop you into a slightly lower orbit, and then you just sit there and wait, and a couple days later you'll be on the other side of the Earth. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like it's expensive. The maneuvers are mostly happening in those small little, basically like elevation changes to mm -hmm. get on different sides. The maneuvers aren't really happening with inclination changes just because it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. and, and this gets into an interesting point because the way space works is good old Einstein figured out that like there's some relationship between gravity, mass, and space, and time. Mm -hmm. And there are points where two different gravity pulling bodies will cancel each other's gravity out. And you create mm -hmm. like what is basically like a phantom planet that you can orbit around. They're called mm -hmm. Lagrangian points, but, but basically just think of them as like points in space where you can effectively park a satellite. Mm -hmm. And so when we start talking about the future of warfighting that could extend into space, these little Lagrangian points, these special places in space where for example, the moon's gravity cancels out the Earth's gravity and you create a little pocket of something mm -hmm. like a place where you can like park a satellite without it moving. Mm -hmm. These become vital strategic places like these become as important as like canals are to maritime domain. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we should when we talk about maneuverability, those are the types of things that you need to be aware of. You can park a satellite at a Lagrangian point. You can park a satellite into orbit around the, around the moon. And mm. it doesn't take much for you to leave the moon's orbit and then mm. return back to Earth and be going extremely fast. Mm -hmm. So like the moon itself can be a staging ground for weapons Mm -hmm. And they can just park there and you have enormous range of options. Mm -hmm. So these are, yeah, you're right. Like these are the things that we have to think about. Maneuverability gets really wacko in like real space. It's, it's way different than like what you see in Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because you can't just turn left or right. It's right, it, like exactly. you, you have to like go with the orbit and you have to change orbit essentially every time you're doing any kind of maneuver. and. It's super non-intuitive. If we're in the same orbit, 
and mm-hmm. I want to like get over to you, mm-hmm. I have to, you know, like imagine I have a little th- thruster in my hand, right? Mm-hmm. And a little engine thruster. I have to point my engine thruster at you and basically, mm-hmm. f- you know, send force away from you so that I drop down into a lo- lower orbit and then I fall back. So it's like trippy. Like when you see, you know, ships docking with the ISS, they're always mm-hmm. docking from the bottom. They're not docking mm-hmm. from the top or from the side. It's because they have to drop into a lower orbit and then they have to move up. You always have to mm-hmm. move up or down to your target if you want to stay in the same inclination. So orbital mechanics gets super weird. Kepler was pretty smart and kind of turned Newton's equations into something that we can use. There's all sorts of clever orbits you can do depending on what you're trying to achieve. And mm-hmm. now like, you know, it used to be that the only type of math equations that we would be crunching is how to get to the moon or how to get through different like orbits around the planets. But now we have to figure out how to orbit other satellites to play these or like fly in formation in space. It's a super challenging math problem. And there are mm. people out there way smarter than me that are learning that. Mm. Well, so, I mean, thinking about like a formation in space, I imagine they look nothing like what you see on the ground because of the maneuverability is just so out of whack with the intuition that you get on the ground. Some of them do. Preston Pish posted a picture of a Starlink constellation that had just been released. And so it was Mm -hmm. before they were separated and it looked like a train. Mm -hmm. It looked like a convoy, right? Of satellites if you look closely in space at night on a dark night Mm -hmm. you will see things that are flying next to each other Mm. right and so you know like those look similar to a you know two planes flying next to each other but yeah you're not going to ever see anything as like remotely similar to what you see in like air fights or dog fights because mm-hmm. there's no air like the convenient thing <laughs> they have you know what are airplanes they just like have a bunch of these things called wings and they use those wings to like flap around and they can make exquisite maneuvers because they have so much air ditto for people swimming around like synchronized swimmers mm-hmm. can do all these just like intricate wonderful maneuvers together because there's so much water to help them there's nothing mm-hmm. like that in space so it becomes it's like a really slow fight, like a dog fight in space. I imagine would be like two sloths fighting, like really, like really. You would have to watch it at like ten x speed for it to be as interesting as like a, you know, like a dog fight. So what are you saying that Star Wars isn't real? Oh my goodness! It doesn't look nearly as cool as like the Battle of Coruscant, where you have these huge ships flying up next to each other with laser cannons blasting each other. Like I wish it were that cool. Hmm. But it's not because of all the orbital dynamics. Physics, and stuff like that. Yeah, physics. Yeah. It's just, it's just, man, you can't get around it. Mm. Well, that that is absolutely fascinating. All right, so my my listeners are gonna kill me if I don't ask you about Bitcoin at least. So, <laughs> can you tell me like what got you into Bitcoin from the Space Force? Right, like are they completely separate or do they have anything to do with each other? What's the deal? Oh, I mean, they're. I think they're extremely similar. If you kind of take a first principles view of what is war, how how it works, what's its function, what are military systems, it, I think it's super duper similar. But in terms of like how I got into it, I guess I remember my friend had telling me about it when it was like three hundred dollars, mm. and like so many other people, I think I was the guy who discredited it. Right. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, that's cool. It sounds neat, but I don't think it'll survive. Like I was, I was convinced that at the time that the government would stop it or, you Mm -hmm. know, something would change. I didn't do the work to fully understand it. And Mm -hmm. so over time though, like one of my jobs used to be to study weapon systems, foreign weapon systems, to study their form and function, what they're used for, what their capabilities are. And in particularly, I was an electronic warfare analyst. Mm. So I know a lot about weapon systems that use electric power projection techniques to defend Mm. themselves, right? And so I guess I kind of was predisposed to understand the concept behind proof of work. 
Mm. And eventually, a, a couple more years passed. It finally clicked what was what Bitcoin really meant, at least to me. And mm-hmm. and then from then on, I I've just been gradually stacking, mm-hmm. and gradually kind of I guess preaching or like explaining to people what the significance of Bitcoin specifically is, what the significance of Bitcoin's proof of work protocol is, what it could mean for humanity, what it could mean about the nature of defense itself, what mm-hmm. it could mean for civilization, and mm-hmm. when I got to like MIT as a National Defense Fellow, my job here is to study the national strategic security implications of emerging technology. Mm. And so here I am, like I'm going to, I got approval and and a lot of encouragement from my superiors to write out my thesis and my research specifically explaining how Bitcoin is, is special from a national strategic security implication viewpoint. Well, can you explain that a little bit? I want our listeners to really get what the security implications are. And, you know, you've written about this and stuff like that, but can you sort of state it in a way that, I don't know, explain like I'm five, right? Like, uh, yeah. what what is the implication for national defense of proof of work, Bitcoin yeah. and all of that? So let me f- flip it on its head. Mm. Let me explain to people who are familiar with how Bitcoin works. Mm. what the role of militaries are, if that makes sense. Mm. So, you know, you have these things called like civilization, right? You have resources. All resources are pesky there because they're limited, right? There's a limited amount of resources, especially like early on, like 4 billion years ago when there wasn't a lot of life around. And so with limited resources and with an abundance of life, beginning to chase after limited resources, there creates this existential imperative to decide who gets what resources. Animals Mm. have to figure that out. Mm. And so it turns out that all animals subscribe, whether they like it or not, to a social consensus protocol that determines what the state and what the chain of custody of ownership of all resources is. Mm. So for example, you know, if I throw, I think, I, I believe you like steak. I think that's like your thing. Uh So if I, if I throw a juicy steak in between a bunch of hungry wolves, a pack of wolves, Mm. who gets to eat that steak? Mm. How do the wolves decide who eats that steak? It's probably the alpha male wolf, right? Yes, exactly. Right. This concept of alpha is effectively animals nominating those who project the most kinetic power in a clever way within them to have basically first dibs. And Mm. so if, if you abstract this out, you get to the, you know, fundamental rule of nature, which is your property is only your property insofar as you can defend it as your property. Mm. Right. Like, you know, if the term pecking order itself it, mm-hmm. for chickens, chickens mm-hmm. do the same thing. Right? All animals mm-hmm. have to figure out who gets what. And so mm. based off of our vulnerabilities of animals, we are vulnerable to kinetic power projection, kinetic proof. Yeah, we'll call it kinetic power projection. If I'm an animal and I, you know, want a certain territory, I can only have that territory insofar as I can defend that territory. Mm. Go watch what happens when the leader of a pride alliance gets killed by another mm-hmm. lion. The property dynamics, the ownership dynamics change really fast. That new lion will go around and like flat out eat and kill all the cubs. And mm-hmm. so it's, uh, you know, nature is metal, as they say, right? Mm. So humans are animals too. We come Mm -hmm. from animals. Another thing about this kinetic power projection game is that it creates a permissionless control structure over limited resources, Mm -hmm. meaning the lion doesn't have to ask permission to eat that steak or Mm -hmm. to take that territory, right? It is a permissionless Mm -hmm. protocol. So long as the animal can project enough uh, kinetic power in a clever way that he requires permission from no one. 
Mm. That's how the game of life works. Mm. And so military is just an extension of life that really only started like 4,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Humans have essentially mastered this kinetic power projection game of life. Mm. 2,000 years ago, there were 200,000 years ago, there were lots of humanoid looking creatures walking around. There were lots of much bigger mammals walking around than there are today. There's woolly mammoths and saber toothed tigers and like massive wildebeests and massive mm -hmm. oxes and just like crazy looking giant power projecting animals. But they pretty much all got slaughtered by humans, <laughs> Homo mm -hmm. sapiens specifically. Mm -hmm. Homo sapiens figured out how to play this power projection game really well. Mm. And so now, 200,000 years later, we admire the bones of woolly mammoths. We admire the bones of saber-toothed <laughs> tigers. We're so powerful that we actually genetically enslaved entire animals to become our food. That mm -hmm. steak that you love, right, is a <laughs> genetically modified, like, badass ox. Like, there used mm -hmm. to be these huge, like, mean types of ox that walk mm -hmm. around. They're very aggressive, just like there used to be a lot of aggressive dogs called wolves walking around. Mm -hmm. But if you capture them and you kill the aggressive ones, but you keep and you breed the docile ones, and you do mm -hmm. that for 10,000 years, you create a cow, which is mm -hmm. essentially a big, juicy target, but docile it doesn't put up a fight and so you mm -hmm. know that you can put up a simple fence and it will just stay in the fence and then you can corral it and kill it and eat it so humans are so metal i guess mm -hmm. that we have create like we genetically enslave wolves for the purpose of them being our pets like if, mm -hmm. you, if you went to an alien planet Jimmy, mm. if you if you went to an alien planet and you wanted to identify what the peak predator was, I guess is an easy way to know what the peak predator is in that alien planet. I would guess they just sort of do whatever they want and no one stops them. Yeah, that's one way. Mm -hmm. I would argue one easy way to tell which alien species is the peak predator is to look for the one that has pets, that keeps pets, <laughs> that has genetically modified animals to be their food to be their mm -hmm. clothes to be mm -hmm. their pets to basically mm -hmm. worship them like mm -hmm. like i love dogs but i remember that like dogs were literally engineered to be so loving right like mm -hmm. dogs came from wolves mm -hmm. and so the point is power projection kinetic power projection is a big deal those who master power projection set the state and chain of custody of resources. And it's precisely through that power projection that we achieve a permissionless control structure over resources. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. What you're saying, I guess, is that you know there's a need to know who owns what. Otherwise, you just end up fighting with each other and you know, like nothing gets done. It, it's just a giant mess. So every animal species, including humans, has some way of determining this property distribution. And it's usually through sort of like fighting without fighting. It's a projection of your ability to fight through, I guess, what you're calling kinetic energy projection. And that in turn allows sort of a more peaceful way of distributing resources, which allows the entire community of, you know, animals or humans or whatever to to thrive because there's no need for fighting and you, you you know you get stuff like property rights as a result of that is that decent summation yeah but it, there's two very important distinctions we need to make mm -hmm. intraspecies property disputes are mm -hmm. settled usually through like the alpha you know the wolves mm -hmm. determining who the alpha is the chickens determining who who the alpha chicken is mm -hmm. they are they don't kill each other completely. Like if you mm. watch a, a pack of wolves fight, they will get to the point where one wolf is on its back and the other wolf has its fangs on the other's throat, but it won't bite because they instinctively know I need this wolf in my pack mm. to survive. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. But some animals actually like grow their own power projection protrusions out of their foreheads mm -hmm. and clash their heads together in mm -hmm. order to effectively achieve the same thing. These are what antlers are for. These are what weird like bug horn things are. They play a game of flip the bug. They play mm -hmm. a game of clash your antlers together. 
it's a kinetic proof of work consensus protocol. But that's intraspecies. Like the species that have survived to this day are the ones that figured out how to not kill each other while establishing a pecking order over mm-hmm. limited resources. But in between species, you see a lot of killing. They don't kind of hold back, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and that's just the game of life. This is just how it is. Well, the problem with like humans. Mm -hmm. I guess before we get there, one great way to project a lot of power is to Mm -hmm. sum it together through cooperation. Mm. So a pack of three wolves is more powerful than a pack of one wolf. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or a tribe of 10,000 humans, human Mm -hmm. beings is more powerful than like five working Mm -hmm. together. And so this idea of summing power together started two billion years ago. Mm. There, four billion years ago, it was nothing but a bunch of unicellular organisms. Two billion years later, a couple cells figured out that like they can gain a lot more resources, right? They can set the state and chain of custody of resources in their favor if they work together. And mm. what was interesting is it was involuntary. Mm-hmm. They didn't actually mean to work together. They just like mm-hmm. stumbled upon this idea of cooperations and that's how we get multicellular organisms. They clustered together accidentally because mutations caused their cell membranes to stick together or they just colonized an area each working by themselves but in the process of colonizing that area they effectively, you know, eliminate the ability for other animals to have those resources. So it's a, what's called a colonization attack. Mm. And so Hey, it turns out like a really good way to win this power projection game is to work together. And that's why you get multicellular organisms. And that game is played all the way up to the point where you get humanoid species. And you've got the Neanderthals and you've got the Homo erectus and you've got the, I don't remember how many there were, but there were a bunch of, you know, different animals that looked pretty similar that had, that knew how to start fire, that knew how Mm -hmm. to cook their food, that had big fat prefrontal cortexes and mm-hmm. one of those species figured out how to have abstract thought they figured mm-hmm. out how to apply meaning to things but like that existed in their brains and so the cool thing about like abstract thought is i no longer have to trust this other animal i just have to trust that other animal believes the same thing I believe. And there's mm. that's two very different distinct capabilities. Neanderthals didn't do this. So Neanderthals were limited in cognitive capability of trusting something like 200, 300 people. It's called Dunbar's number. There's just a mm-hmm. certain number of people that you can recognize and trust. And so the, the tribes of Neanderthals were no more than 200, 300 people, whatever the limit was, their cognitive limit was. But Homo sapiens could scale their cooperation way more because Mm. they don't need to trust that person. They just need to trust that person believes in the same thing they believe. And this was a cooperation at massive scale. It allowed Homo sapiens to cooperate way more than they would have if they were limited purely by their own cognitive thinking. And so I say all this because it's important to remember that the game of life is a game of power projection. It's usually kinetic power projection. One great way to be better at power projection is to cooperate. Cooperation itself is a predatory competitive advantage. Mm. And, you know, through this game of cooperation, through this game of what is war? War is a kinetic proof of work protocol for settling disputes on who owns what. It is a proof of work protocol for determining who gets to write the ledger. Sound familiar? Like, yeah. It, it, what is history? History is a running ledger written by the people who won the kinetic proof of work game. Mm. Sound mm. familiar? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, you know, this is, it's not a coincidence, the relationship here. This is just how you achieve permissionless. And if, if, any of those controllers over property, the people who set the state and chain of custody and have the, quote, legal authority to define what the ownership is, if those people begin to be oppressive with their control authority, what does mm-hmm. power projection enable you to do? Power projection preserves the ability to countervail the control authority of those oppressive controllers. Mm. So, 
and remember, this is what makes it a permissionless protocol. If you have the ability to countervail the control authority of an oppressor, mm -hmm. then you, by definition, don't need their permission mm. to own right. the thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so, by the way, if you have to, if you don't have the ability to project power, then you tacitly have to trust someone mm. to someone else to define what ownership is, who owns what. Mm. And so militaries are an extension of this four billion year old game, I would argue, mm. of power projection to determine what the to achieve consensus on what the legitimate state and chain of custody is. We sit here and we just acknowledge that someone from Switzerland is a Switzerland person. We don't remember that the reason why that country exists, the reason why the boundaries of all countries exist is because of a game of kinetic power projection that mm. set that boundary, right? Mm. The reason why America exists, the reason why we identify as Americans is because a bunch of people from North America started to think that their government was being oppressive and decided to exercise their kinetic proof of work protocol to countervail the control authority of the monarchy. And now we set our own state and chain of custody of mm. our resources that we can control. So that is the function of a military. It is to achieve. The good thing about a military is, at least traditionally, not recently, is that it always preserves the ability for users to stand up, to achieve, like to take what they need if the person who defines it currently is being oppressive. So like the mm. way to defend yourself, to be to have a secure control structure, to have a non-oppressive control structure over property is to preserve the ability for users to project power to countervail the control authority of the existing controllers. Mm. Okay, so that is military in a way of thinking about military. Mm. The military projects kinetic power. Why? To make it too expensive not to cooperate with the person who owns the military. Or mm -hmm. at least to to tilt the return on investment calculus to make it always like way more rewarding to cooperate than it is to not cooperate. Mm. Okay, because if you don't do that, like if you don't have a military, if we decide we're going to create our own thing and we're going to define how we believe things should work, and you don't have a military. And then like me and you are super successful and we have all these amazing resources and abundance and stuff, but you, we still don't have a military, then there is, you create an enormous return on investment for some other third party to just walk in and take your stuff, <laughs> right? Like the only reason you can claim ownership of anything is insofar as you can defend your ownership of that thing. And so mm -hmm we have to create what are effectively power projection apparatuses to mm -hmm. prevent that from happening. So another way of thinking about it is this, the power of every bullet, the power of every bomb, the power of every engine behind every tank, every truck, every ship, every sub, every airplane, the power behind the heartbeat of every service member of every military that's ever served in the world is measured quite literally, in watts. Those watts are expended for the purpose of defending property, mm. defending a rule of law, defending whatever needs to be defended. And yes, it is super inefficient to create a giant standing military that does nothing but sit there and defend your rule of law or whatever you're, you want to say you own. Mm -hmm. But even more expensive than creating a standing military is being invaded or being <laughs> conquered by another military. So if you read history, you read a story of nothing but like people thinking it's too, you know, people trying to be, quote, more efficient with their military and then getting conquered. The point mm -hmm. of the military is quite literally to project power, to spend watts. Mm -hmm. We sail constantly ships all around the world. We were constantly testing intercontinental ballistic missiles with nukes, well, with inert nukes on them, right? Mm. Like I used to wake up at night from the sound of ICBMs being launched for where I used to work. Mm. I have been woken up many times of the sound of bombers scrambling or fighter pilots scrambling. These are projections of power. These are 
uses of energy, we use and spend that energy to make it too expensive to be uncooperative with mm. the people who are currently setting the state of ownership and the chain of custody of ownership. So that's a really long way of explaining military as effectively a way to preserve a permissionless control structure over property. What's interesting is how does that relate to Bitcoin? Mm. You can create power two ways. What is power? Power is the transfer of energy per unit time, mm. joules per second or watts. Mm -hmm. You can create energy multiple different ways. You don't have to create it kinetically. So a kinet, you, know, you create kinetic energy by applying force to mass and displacing the mass, but you can create electric energy by applying charge to resistor. Mm. Either way, it doesn't matter. It's still joules. Joules are joules. Mm -hmm. It's Joules per second are joules per second. It's the exact same physical thing. Mm -hmm. It's just achieved differently. For physical property and for physical meat space, meat bags like ourselves, kinetic proof of work is kind of how it works, right? Like we, mm -hmm. we live in a kinetic domain. Therefore, kinetic power projection is the way that you control the state and chain of custody over kinetic domain resources. Mm -hmm. But there's something super interesting about money itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in so far as like we need certain kinetic domain stuff, like, you know, there's no chance anytime soon that me and you are going to stop valuing water. Mm -hmm. We probably won't stop valuing oxygen. <laughs> We're going to continue to like land or space, mm -hmm. but Money doesn't have to be any of those things. Money can shape shift. Money can take any shape. And if you take money out of the kinetic domain and you park it in the electric domain digitally, mm -hmm. then you can apply the same proof of work permissionless control structure over it. But the cool thing about this particular control structure is no one has to bleed. Mm. Right? That's a huge you know, like, again, Deere figured out how to do this through, they figured out a surrogate to war, a surrogate to fighting by growing protrusions out of their faces called antlers. They figured out a consensus protocol for settling disputes and achieving the legitimate state of custody and ownership. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, what I think humans are doing, this sounds ridiculous, I know, but I think humans have actually discovered their antlers. We have mm. figured out a way to maintain this power projection permissionless protocol over property, but a very specific type of property that we can now monetize. Mm. And that becomes really important because the problem with the kinetic power projection proof of work consensus protocol is that humans are too good at it. Mm. We scaled it a little bit too far. Mm. To the point of now, if we ever wanted to countervail, if an oppressor emerged mm -hmm. and, it, and that oppressor was armed with nuclear weapons, how do you countervail their control authority? Mm. It's too expensive. You risk nuclear annihilation. Mm. You risk the end of the species. So with the advent of nuclear weapons and with the continual proliferation of nuclear weapons, my thesis is going to argue that we've essentially created, we've lost our permissionless control structure over specifically money. But mm. so how do we reestablish a permissionless control structure over money in order to set the state and chain of custody of it, in order to always have the ability to countervail the control authority of people who are abusive with their control authority. Mm. And so that, to me, is what fundamentally Bitcoin represents. It's humans discovering their antlers. And what's fascinating is if you pull apart how Bitcoin works, you'll notice that like it's all designed from military defense technology that was explicitly for defending against nuclear strikes. So, for example, TCP IP, where did that come mm -hmm. from? It came from the military. It came from mm -hmm. DARPA. Mm -hmm. It was intended to be able to preserve command and control through nuclear strikes. Mm -hmm. Where does GPS come from? GPS, people think it comes from people who wanted to like learn how to navigate and have precision timing better. But essentially, the real reason why we have... GPS is so that it can guide a Trident submarine-launched nuclear ballistic missile to Moscow if they struck mm. first, if they shot first. Mm. 
So we mm. built GPS as a Cold War weapon system. And then we just realized later that like it's awesome for way more than just guiding submarine launch ballistic missiles at our enemies. Mm. What mm. about, you know, Shaw? Mm -hmm. Shaw came, it was designed by the NSA. You know, it was a security function. Encryption has been around for thousands of years by for use by militaries to preserve and defend communications against like prying eyes. Mm. And so these big pieces of Bitcoin are quite literally nuke resistant technology designed mm. explicitly to be resilient through nuclear strike. And so what that means is after humanity scaled the kinetic power projection game too far and made it too expensive to use now, we also created all these other nuclear resistant technologies. And now we figured out a way to harness these nuclear resistant technologies to restore the permissionless power projection game that we lost mm. specifically for digital property, right? So mm. like people get confused. I'm not arguing that Bitcoin ends war. Mm. We'll still need a kinetic power projection apparatus for forms of property that exist in the kinetic domain mm -hmm. for water, for land, for physical resources. But none of those things have to be our money. We mm. can digitize our money. And if we digitize our money and we reestablish a permissionless control structure over that money, then we've reestablished our way to be secure against oppression, mm. for at least in terms of monetary oppression. And that's mm. a big deal. People mm. think that like the United States dollar or other forms of fiat currencies are, quote, digital, but they're not. Those are contractual based currencies. Those contracts are based off of rule of law. That rule of law is based off of the war that was won to achieve the legitimacy of that rule of law. And I know that like a popular thing on Twitter is to like bash the United States dollar as a proof of war system. But I think people on Twitter forget that there's a lot more, like a lot of things are proof of war systems. If you identify as a citizen of a country, it's because a war was fought and won and went, or many wars were fought in one. Like look how many wars it took for France to say France, for mm. Germany to say Germany, for United Kingdom to say United Kingdom. And the legal ownership of anything is dependent on the validity of a law and the, the validity mm -hmm. of law is dependent on war. Mm -hmm. War comes first. Like, mm -hmm. War and fighting has been around for four billion years. Or law kinetic has... power projection. Exactly. Uh, yeah, 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 that's a better way of saying it. It's, yeah. yeah. Kin kinetic power projection has been around for four billion years. Only four thousand years ago, have humans started getting clever enough to like write down these things called laws. Mm -hmm. And the main purpose of laws is just so we don't have to fight over stuff. Ain't nobody mm -hmm. got time to fight over every little thing. Mm -hmm. If we started using law. But then you run into the same problem. How do you define what the legitimate law is? How do you settle disputes on what legitimate law is? Mm. How do you achieve the state and chain of custody as, as it exists? You know, if someone passed a law that said, from now on, I get first night with all brides, <laughs> like, you know, some people might have a problem with that. And you know what? Thanks to kinetic power projection, they have a permissionless way to countervail the control authority of something they a law they disagree with right mm. and so what is bitcoin bitcoin to me is not interesting because it creates a digital property it's easy to create digitized property in my opinion it's not mm. even hard now to create scarce digital mm -hmm. property there's mm -hmm. thousands of them mm -hmm. what bitcoin is special to me for is its control structure mm. it's bitcoin is special because it is proof of work Bitcoin mm. is special because it obeys nature. It obeys the law of nature. Those who project the most power in the most clever way win the right to write the ledger, determine the state and chain of custody of property. And if anybody, what we'll call these, these things called miners, if these miners that are writing the ledger mm. become abusive or oppressive with their control authority, guess what? All users have the ability to countervail their control authority using what? Power, projection of power. <laughs> and even more so, 
the ability to project power is always getting cheaper. It has never been cheaper to mine than it has been now. People get confused because they use dollars as their denominator. No, we're talking about a totally new system in Bitcoin denominated terms. It's getting easier and easier and cheaper and cheaper to mine. It's cheaper now. Like, what is how much does an S19 cost in, in Bitcoin? Like 0.4, 0.3? Mm-hmm. You know, how many Bitcoin did it take to buy a USB miner a while ago? Probably more than 0.3 or 4 Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. So if you preserve the ability for users, to be able to project power to countervail control authority. And it's always getting cheaper and easier to project power to countervail control authority. You create a safe system, a secure system that protects itself against oppression. All right. So Jason, that was a lot. And there's a lot there to process. But basically what I'm getting is that there's a social coordination that is required. And we have this sort of like status structure there in order to avoid this, the fighting. And this is what you call the kinetic power projection game. Can you explain a little bit more about this idea of social coordination that results as a result of of having this sort of like structure in society and how that prevents, you know, a waste of resources? Yeah, so you've just heard me rant incoherently on all these different ideas that have been firing in my brain that I have to figure out how to bring together in a coherent manner and then present them in a thesis. I have to mm. kind of clean up this train of thought. And and to do that, I and to also answer your question, I've been looking into things from like philanthropy. I actually got a great book recommendation that is called ultra society it's it's a a philanthropist who makes the case that if you study the history of human civilizations the emergent property of the societies that have the best i guess militaries is mass cooperation at scale Mm. for whatever reason i don't know why exactly People, actually, I think I do. People tend to cooperate more, even if it's involuntary, right? Or even if it's through basically fear of dying, right? At Mm. massive scales because of this kinetic proof of work game. And like I said before, this is a game that has been played for 4 billion years for whatever reason we fight each other and for whatever reason people like even as much as they hate to admit it they tacitly subscribe to this protocol they legitimize this protocol like that's why we recognize the rule of law as the rule of law we are tacitly validating the fighting that went into establishing that rule of law Mm. i think if you look at it from this way that i just described you can see that as awful as kinetic power projection can be and as messy as it gets, I can't think of any other way that you would achieve a permissionless control over authority over resources. If you don't have the option to project power in some clever way to countervail whoever is in control of resources, then by definition, you must be under a permissionless control structure. You are accepting permission from somebody Mm. and obviously like i said before humans do this game better than any other animal you can actually measure the level at which i guess animals cooperate together by Mm. like just measuring the amount of time that they build stuff together and so like these anthropologists will actually measure how many, I guess, you know, human hours is required to build whatever temple, right? Mm. And and they'll compare that to how many bee hours are required to build a beehive or ant hours are required to build an ant nest. And what we see is that humans dwarf all other forms of animals by like a significant margin with the amount of cooperation, the amount of time we spend cooperating together to build these masterpieces like the ISS, for example. But but what's more interesting is there's a direct correlation between the scale at which we cooperate 
and the scale at which we fight each other. Mm. And the fighting comes first, and mm. then we build the temple. And you know, the fighting comes first, and then we have the rule of law. Mm. The Cold War happened before we teamed up with the Russians to build the ISS, if that makes sense. So mm. it's useful to think of this as a it's the world has complex emergent properties. Society has complex emergent properties. The value that things bring is not necessarily coupled to the form. And for whatever reason, power projection just keeps working really well. So that's just something to think about. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think what you're saying is power projection is there as a way to not have to actually spend that power, right? Like there, if you can project that power, kind of like uh, your analogy with the deer antlers, you don't actually have to fight. You can, or at least to the death, you can have that power projection just sort of show and that sort of orders everybody into this cooperative mode where we can achieve all sorts of really good things and not have to fight over resources. And you have sort of like boundaries around property as a result of that. Is, is that an accurate way of putting it? Yeah, I think that's exactly the great way to put it. I'm glad we're recording this so I can <laughs> remember how we're having this combo. So like when I was deployed, it was common to see bombers scramble mm. and fly over Afghanistan, but they weren't actually dropping any bombs. What we mm. would do is called something called show of force. Mm. Where if there's a convoy in Afghanistan and they're taking shots from someone in the mountains, you call in a bomber and you have the bomber turn on their terrain following computer mm. and they'll fly really low, really fast across mm. the terrain. I don't know if you've ever experienced a low altitude, fast flying B-2 bomber fly overhead. I have. <laughs> I have and not. I will say it's terrifying. <laughs> uh -huh. And so what happens when we do that is you don't get any more shots coming from that mountain anymore for the rest of the day. You have what we call a projection of force, a show of force. Mm. The It disincentivizes whoever's being uncooperative for the mm. rest of the day. And that's why like, you have to have a standing military. The best militaries are the ones that don't have to do any fighting. They just sit there. On the surface, it looks inefficient because why are you paying for this giant military, this giant legion of soldiers? Mm. But if you don't do that, then some other country or some, you know, Genghis Khan is going to walk up to your border and guess what? Like you're now part of the Mongolian horde if you, or you're dead, right? Mm. Or you're part of the, you know, Roman kingdom or, you know, like, or the, you know, the British Empire, the Roman Empire, this is just how the game works. So you have to have a military to preserve trade routes. You have to have a military to protect whatever you want to define as yours. And ideally, you never use it and you just scale, 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 scale. And so we get all the way up to the point where we're at today where I don't know if you've ever seen a nuclear missile. I've seen several. Mm -mm. These are awful things. Hopefully, they will never, ever be used, ever, right? The purpose of a nuclear missile is to never, ever use them, never, ever have to use them. Mm. And, but the, you know, the issue is if we get to that point where we are now, where we've scaled this power projection game kind of to ensure cooperation at large scales to the point where it's too expensive, then well, crap, we actually still need some mechanism to countervail control authority of, of oppressors in order to maintain a permissionless state over property. If we can't do that, if it's too expensive to do that, then we've, by definition, lost – civilization has lost its ability to have a permissionless control structure over property. We now must trust nuclear powers, nuclear you know, armed entities – not to be abusive with their control authority over property. Well, let's get into that a little bit because we're talking about these permissionless control structures. 
But, you know, like from a practical standpoint, I know that I need to go get permission even to start a business, for example, in the in, in the U.S. or whatever. You have to get the right permits. If I want to change things to my house, they all require permission. And as you said before, there's like a kinetic power projection that authorities have that require, you know, that get you to cooperate, not necessarily through you know, good incentives, usually through bad incentives, right? We'll throw you in prison or fine you or something like that. So in that sense, it's not necessarily permissionless. So can you explain a little bit more about what a permissionless control structure over resources actually means? Like, what does that mean practically as far as property is concerned? Yeah, I guess one way to think about it is why aren't you asking permission from China or Russia? to start a business, Mm. right? It's because the United States military has prevented China or Russia. Like the permissionless state is local to your government, to your, whatever your local military is. Mm. So, and by the way, that's another limitation that we can talk about later that Bitcoin solves is now, you know, Bitcoin takes that local permissionless down to the individual level rather than down to whatever your local like military is. Mm. And and so, you know, the rule of law, I guess like the constitution started like a decade after the revolutionary war started. Mm. People forget that. You create rules of law to formalize contracts, to enforce contracts. You do that as effectively a surrogate to warfare. You create a rule of law and you agree to follow the rule of law because ain't nobody got time to have little fights and go to war or kill each other over, you know, like kind of lower level property disputes. We want to kind of reserve the fighting for broad level stuff. Like we'll fight over large encompassing rules of law, but we won't fight over, you know, small little contracts. But you kind of do. Right. That's why you have, you know, the police in some senses when people don't obey whatever the, you know, local laws are, you have some form of enforcement. It's twofold. There's the carrot and there's the stick. Right. The carrot Mm -hmm. is, you know, if we cooperate together, we get more. The stick is if you don't cooperate, you'll suffer in some way or you'll be harmed in some way. That's an interesting point to make because Bitcoin does the same thing. Bitcoin has both the carrot and the stick. The stick is what happens to people who try to attack the network, what happens to people if they try to perform denial of service attacks to the users of Bitcoin. Bitcoin will harm those people. It's just it'll harm their pocketbooks, right? Mm. And so that's kind of the way I see it. I don't know... I know that like there's a lot of people, especially in the Bitcoin space, that are like politically aligned to maybe it's anarchy, but basically as minimal government interference as possible, right? Like mm. minimal having some third party tell me what I can and can't do. Mm. I totally relate to that. The problem is that is like literally a biological uncompetitive posture. Like look what happened to the people who were native to this land, right? The people who kind of think that way. If if you think, okay, I'm only going to, we're only going to have small government. We're only going to be, you know, we're not going to like impose our views broader than our local tribes. That's cool. But like good luck surviving when the, the colonialists arrive with massive cooperation at scale. Like this is what happened to the Neanderthals. Mm. I would much prefer, like, I think most people would prefer that this type of game wasn't played, but for whatever reason it is, and for whatever reason, like, I guess I'm saying if, like, strict anarchy or strict libertarianism worked, it would be, like, there's a reason why that's not, like, the dominant government. It's, like, your government is only as powerful as the military that can defend that government from collapsing, if that makes sense. And so that- I I think what you're pointing at here is this idea of power summation through cooperation, right? Like uh, you talked about that a a little bit before, but basically if you cooperate, you have way more power as a result of having 
a large number of people. And this is definitely true in sort of like this kinetic world that we're talking about, the physical world. You have more people, well, you're going to be able to cooperate in ways that you're not going to be able to as a small tribe or something like that. That's essentially the control structure that we're forced into because of sort of like the sizes of the relative things that, you know, countries, I guess, that, that, that we have in the world. And that's, I think what you're saying is that because those are sort of the default or what we're at right now, you can't really have anything smaller and be able to resist against a power control structure that's that large, at least in the kinetic realm. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's a beautiful summation. And I would just add that, you know, recall the what we were talking about earlier when mm. there was only single cellular organisms mm. and a couple of those single cellular organisms started cooperating together and becoming multicellular entities. When they did that, it was not voluntary. They weren't mm. even aware it was happening. They literally didn't have eyeballs, right? They didn't have brains yet. They couldn't see or understand what they were doing. And those multicellular organisms became quite powerful. And, uh, you know, they were able to set the state and chain of custody of the resources they wanted to far more effectively than single cellular organisms. And that game has played ever since then. So oftentimes you'll see that these mass levels of cooperation aren't explicitly intentional. Mm. They emerge naturally just from the way physics works. And the way physics works is everyone, all living creatures are vulnerable to being eaten by another <laughs> organism, essentially. Well, uh, so the question then is, why don't we have just like, it would seem that the the direction of cooperation should just get larger and larger. And then at some point, like it would just be one sort of world thing. There seem to be forces on the other side. So for example, the Roman Empire collapsed at, at some point, and they certainly had this enormous power summation that they were able to use to, at least militarily, to conquer, you know, most of the world as they knew it at the time. But, you know, at some point they started to collapse. What causes sort of like this cooperation to no longer work? Like, when is the power summation no longer you know, like effective where you're not able to get all of the power that you would normally get from each individual summing together. And instead you start like not having cooperation. Yeah. Like trust goes away or something. What happens? So the way I think about this is you go back to why did Homo sapiens kick so much ass 2000 mm. years ago? They were the only humanoid species with a prefrontal cortex that started using it to do abstract thought. Abstract thought, as I said before, was useful because it allowed Homo sapiens to conquer the cognitive limits of Dunbar's number, meaning they can begin to, I guess, effectively trust way more people, scale trust and cooperation way farther than traditional tribes could or any animals can. And so that was cool at conquering Dunbar's number, but a problem now becomes, well, you don't actually get away from Dunbar's number completely. He, Homo sapiens can form abstractions, right? They can form allegiances with each other. They can believe in some thing together in order for them to cooperate with each other. But different groups of Homo sapiens will still have competing abstractions. Mm. So you create another Dunbar's number, but for abstractions, there's different gods that some societies worship. There's different ethical beliefs that some societies believe in. And so you create Dunbar's number, but abstractions for themselves. And it, it, to me, it's interesting that if you look at the number of nations that exist, it's perfectly in line with Dunbar's number, right? So we, we can scale cooperation much larger, but we still haven't fully been able to find some single quote truth for everyone to completely like cooperate with, like to everyone to believe in the same way. I think it has a lot to do with our just limitations as human beings, our, our brains, you know, we discriminate against each other. We have all kinds of competing ethical or abstraction ideas. And so that's an issue. And, and this gets to why Bitcoin is so special in my opinion, 
Hmm. The Romans specifically, I mean, there's a lot of people that will, there's a lot of different, like, this gets back to what you're effectively asking is for a causation model. What caused, in this case, the massive loss of the Roman strength? Hmm. What caused the loss of Mongolian empire strength? What caused the loss of British empire? I don't know, there, but but I do know that money probably, at least for the Romans, played a big part. Hmm. At the end of the day, it's effectively like there's a limit to what types of the amount of cooperations that humans can achieve due to our own issues. So if we created some type of system to believe in where, you know, very much like multicellular organisms, it allowed us to cooperate involuntarily, Mm. then maybe we could conquer the limit of the Dunbar's number of abstractions that we currently have. So said a different way, imagine a world where everyone owns and uses something like Bitcoin. Mm. Bitcoin is a pristine defense system. If you own Bitcoin, you have like literally a nuclear resistant defense infrastructure. If you own Bitcoin, you are highly secure against oppression. Mm. And if you own Bitcoin, there's like no capacity to discriminate against other people who own Bitcoin because you like, how do you discriminate against a string of numbers and letters representing Mm. some anonymous address? So what I absolutely love about Bitcoin is that it it kind of retreats, it solves humans' discrimination limitations mm. by making ownership anonymous, by protecting us essentially against ourselves. And then Bitcoin creates a shelling point where it's in everyone's best interest to own it. The more that you project power, the more you make the system secure. And if your competitor or your enemy owns Bitcoin, their productivity means real world gains for you, Mm. which means like you create frenemies, you actually benefit from your competitor's productivity. And so in my opinion, Bitcoin is like the evolutionarily equivalent to when cellular membranes started becoming sticky and forced what would be enemy single cellular organisms to stick together and work Mm. together. Bitcoin does the same thing for humans. It eliminates our ability to discriminate each other. It like actually harms us if we, you know, like if we hurt the productive gains of our competitors because our own gains decrease. Mm. It's fascinating. I think Bitcoin could be one of those things that you already see it. Like before China banned all the miners in China, we were effectively cooperating with Chinese people like miners, even though they're quote competing against each other to, you know, win the knots and win the next block, you are simultaneously working together to improve the hash rate. Like you're benefiting each other. So maybe the money can be the way that we unite countries like together. Yes. We will still have our limitations. We'll still discriminate each other. We'll still hate, each other for random silly reasons but at least that won't impinge on our ability to like trade and cooperate through money well it's interesting because the way you described the advantage that homo sapiens had over the neanderthals was this ability to get past the dunbar's number using belief systems And what you described sounds like, well, money is also kind of a belief system and it causes this sort of cooperation where you wouldn't otherwise have it. And it very much is a belief system, especially in a fiat system or whatever. So it seems like what you're saying is that when you have money that is good, that isn't necessarily controlled by a single entity or something like that, where you have the option of countervailing the you know, control authority. There is no control authority in Bitcoin. So it gives us a way to cooperate at a massive scale that you wouldn't otherwise have. What you're describing to me, at least, is this market process where people can sort of, you know, not necessarily know very much about each other, but still buy and sell from each other and trade. And that in of itself causes sort of like a very natural cooperation that doesn't have to rely on, you know, a shared belief in 
you know, religion or something like that or politics. It's it's just okay. There's money, and that's really all you need. Is that an accurate summation? Yeah, I would say that's half of it. So yeah, I totally agree. Money is a belief system. Hmm. Abstractions. There's a lot of things that like humans believe are real that are actually just only exist in our brains. Like there's no physical manifestation. They might still be real, but you know, not to an animal. Like go show a a map of different countries to like an animal. Are they gonna know what that means? Are they gonna <laughs> agree? Right? No. Those are just shared abstractions. A country is just an idea in our brains. A rule of law is just an idea in our brains that humans subscribe to. Go show an animal a bunch of different symbols for like money. Right? Mm. There's all types of different symbols. Go show an animal a bunch of different symbols for language. Mm. They don't know what language only exists in the brains of humans. Mm. Money is the same way. It's a shared abstraction. It effectively represents human exertion, right? We have abstracted the money is kind of like a battery, like money is a human abstraction for stored energy, stored mm. human energy. If you have money, you can trade that for stored human energy of some kind. Mm. It is a shared abstraction network, no different than a bunch of people believing they're part of the same country or the same whatever. Mm. But like all networks, it's vulnerable to Metcalf's law. So Metcalf's law says the value of a network increases exponentially as the number of users increases linearly. Mm. So the larger a network becomes, the larger a shared abstraction becomes, the more valuable it is. This is especially true for money. Like the more people that agree that a money is a money, the more useful that money is, right? Also, money is only valuable insofar as people agree it's money. And this brings up an interesting like point to what some people unfortunately forget is like if you disenfranchise the users of your network, Metcalf's law works both ways. Mm. They can leave and the value of your network decreases exponentially as the number of users decrease linearly. So you don't want to do anything that will piss off your users and cause them to effectively cancel that network. Mm. So that's one half of it. But the other half that I think that like, that half is well understood, well articulated. There are people that are way better at describing that than, than me. The other half is Bitcoin is quite like it is the stick. It is a, its own power projection mechanism. It's its own defense. It's its own military. You literally can't invade Bitcoin like you could, but it's extremely hard to, right? Like it's not a negotiation. Bitcoin isn't a no negotiation. You're not going to realistically find all miners forever and stop them from participating in this defense system. You're not going to bomb the internet and then like somehow like stop Bitcoin that way. It's its own legal infrastructure, right? It doesn't need, it would be nice to have it, but it doesn't technically, you know, need legal protection because it has its own rule of law written into C++ and it is its own legislation and voting network with nodes. And so, like, you know, it, it achieves cooperation the same way that fighting causes humans to cooperate on larger and larger scales. It's, it's almost like a biological necessity. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really interesting because, you know, like, in my opinion, it, like I said before, it's a sticky membrane, right? It's forcing us to cooperate with each other involuntarily mm -hmm. and be precisely because it's involuntary that like, and, or because we don't know we're even doing it. I think it has real potential to be the thing, the key technology that enables human beings to scale cooperation past the nation state level. Mm. I think that this ongoing emphasis of quote, the metaverse is like humans discovering that the internet itself is its own sovereign power. It's its own sovereign entity with its own sovereignty. And that is at least equal to, but possibly even transcends the sovereignty of the nation state. Hmm. So, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, it's interesting what you're saying, because 
We have sort of like the physical world, which requires, like you said, kinetic power projection, right? Like if you want cooperation in the physical realm, that's definitely something that is required. And that's what standing militaries are for and so on. But we have this additional abstract stuff, all of the metaphysical, if you will, things that, that you describe that like no animal would recognize a country, for example, or symbols for the dollar and so on. That is significant. It's not insignificant. In fact, like all software, all, you know, all, all kinds of things are that are digital are essentially metaphysical. They don't have necessarily like a location. They're not based in physical things necessarily. And Bitcoin is one of those things. And I think what you're saying is that within this metaphysical realm of the digital, the internet, the, you know, all of this stuff that has almost its own rule of law, it doesn't necessarily have to have this kinetic power projection in order to enforce cooperation. All you need, I guess, is maybe like an electric power projection or something within the realm of, in this realm where it's got a whole different rule set because possession here means something kind of different. And, you know, like uh, boundaries here are, you know, different than physical boundaries and so on. Is that maybe like, I don't know, those are the thoughts that come to mind. What do you think? There's a saying from Latin, it's called natura non facit saltis, which means mm -hmm. nature does not make jumps. Mm. And the way I think of it is, yeah, we have kinetic power projection. This is how we determine the pecking order. This is how we know who gets ownership, what rules of law are the quote, legitimate rules of law. And what Bitcoin does is it takes all of that exact same physics. It's, it's literally not even different physics. Kinetic mm. power projection is, is joules per second, is watts. Electric power projection is joules per second, is watts. The only difference is how the energy in that power was derived. Kinetic uses force against mass. Electric uses cross resistor. But the structure is identical. The rules of the game are identical. So there's, you know, nature does not make leaps. Nothing has actually changed. All at least in terms of the rules and in terms of the physics, all that's changed is the manner in which the electricity was, or the energy was created. And there are some things that we can't not use kinetic power projection for. Like I said before, you know, me and you are going to probably not change our love for water and oxygen, hmm. but there's nothing at all that says that the form of money has to be a physical form where kinetic power projection is the way to achieve the legitimate state and chain of custody and, and protect it against oppression, right? Like we as human beings can choose to make money a different form. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's happening with Bitcoin. I think humans are starting to monetize a new form of property and in so doing we're effectively transposing war itself from a kinetic power projection game to an electric power projection game and i think we already know this i think bitcoin like you hear bitcoiners often making the claim that bitcoin could reduce war but i haven't found anyone make like articulate why and so that's kind of part of my hypothesis and what i want to do with my thesis is I want to take a first principles look at the function of warfare and show that Bitcoin reduces the need for war insofar as we fight over monetized property because it literally is war. It creates a digital surrogate to war. It takes the same value delivered function, but utilizes electric proof of work rather than kinetic proof of work, which means no one has to bleed to use this protocol. Mm -hmm. And so if we monetize Bitcoin, we don't need to nominate people like we do today to wear uniforms like I have to wear to kill each other and to settle our monetary property disputes. We would only need militaries to defend the utilitarian value of physical resources, which would probably mean a lot less fighting because what's the, you know, what's the ROI for blocking trade routes or stealing property that isn't monetized. It's probably much lower. Mm. So if you, you know, a different way to say it is, by monetizing Bitcoin, we're effectively 
unsubscribing from the kinetic power projection game, at least insofar as it's played to achieve consensus on the legitimate state and chain of custody of monetized property. We don't get the option to unsubscribe from kinetic proof of work because of our limitations as living creatures. Hmm. So, but money is special, like I said before. And when we're, and by making this transition from a kinetic proof of work system to an electric proof of work system, we get all kinds of additional benefits that people are only beginning to like scrape the surface on comprehending. For example, as we've seen in the kinetic proof of work competition, this is an infrastructure destroying competition. The end mm. of a traditional war is rubble and destruction and blood, but an electric proof of work competition is an infrastructure building competition. Mm. Hash wars increase the security of the network. They make energy production more fruitful. The end of a hash war is cheaper energy for everyone. And like, by the way, how much would we need to fight for stuff in the future, like fresh water, if energy are so cheap that you can just desalinate water at a massive scale? Like there's second and third order effects to this new form of quote warfare. Hmm. And so people think of Bitcoin just through the lens of finance hmm. and they miss the bigger picture in my brain. They think of like Bitcoin as the biggest technological revolution of monetary property since gold. And I think that's accurate, but I think it still undersells the value of Bitcoin because from my point of view, Bitcoin's the biggest technological revolution of warfare since ever. Humans are transposing warfare into the digital domain to restore a permissionless control structure over monetary property. And that's huge. It's like from a military technologist perspective, which is what I represent, Bitcoin is kind of a masterpiece. You know, in the process of building and monetizing Bitcoin's infrastructure, we're creating a new system altogether that incentivizes cooperation between competitors. Mm. And so, like, that's a big deal. From a national security perspective, that's a big deal. I'm calling it mutually assured preservation to distinguish it from the shelling point that we get with kinetic power projection, which is essentially mutually assured destruction. We hold a knife to each other's throats and say, don't do that bad thing. Mm. And yeah, so it's like, it's unbelievable what could happen if more people choose to quote unsubscribe from the kinetic power projection game over their money. And the last thing I'll say is like, it doesn't matter if you believe you are, you know, currently under risk of like being oppressed, right? Because it exists. Like it doesn't matter. I guess like Bitcoin is more powerful than militaries. Bitcoin has a rule of law as powerful as existing rules of law. And we know for sure that using the kinetic proof of work game, the kinetic power projection game to countervail the control authority of oppressors, if they would ever emerge, regardless of if they actually have, if they ever emerge, we know for sure that we can't countervail their control authority now. It's like guaranteed, right? Mm. And so to me, like Bitcoin is inevitable in every possible way. This gets to like where we've come full circle to our conversation at the beginning about the creation of the U.S. Space Force. Mm. I think this is the lens through which the U.S. should be evaluating Bitcoin as a technology, in my opinion. Bitcoin's a pristine, nuclear-resistant property defense technology that's being adopted at a massively fast pace. When the primary technology for defending property changes, it's never a negotiation. You have to change with it. The shelling point becomes that new technology. So for example, when the primary technology for defending property changed from swords to guns, it wasn't a negotiation. Right. <laughs> Orban, the engineer, paid a visit to Constantinople and offered to build this thing for him. Constantinople turned him down. A year later, the walls of Constantinople are being shot down by Orban, who's now working for, you know, the, I think it was Emperor Mohammed. Mm. So, like, you know, the shelling point becomes everybody who wants to defend their property must have guns mm. when guns are introduced. When the primary technology for defending property changed from ground-based guns and bombs to airborne guns and bombs, like we talked about, mm. 
it wasn't a negotiation. The shelling point becomes everybody who wants to defend their property must have airplanes. Now the primary technology for defending property is evolving from terrestrial air breathing systems to space-based systems. And it's not mm. a negotiation. The shelling point is everyone who <laughs> wants to defend their property must have a space force. That's why we have a space force. Mm. Bitcoin is a new technology for defending property through electric proof of work. And like everything else I just described, it isn't a negotiation. The shelling point is everybody who wants to defend their money must use Bitcoin. Mm. Else they risk oppression. Like that's why I also proof of stake doesn't work won't work. It won't defend you from oppression because there is no way to impeach the control authority of the top stakers. You you have to trust them. You have to make sure those people are reliable. Hmm. Hmm. Well, so sort of rolling it back a little bit, because I think all of this comes down to what you said before, which is that defense of property is always measured in energy, right? Like you need to defend your property, whether it's in the physical or in the metaphysical world, whatever property you have, it needs defense. And that defense can take the form of a safe or something like that. But at a larger level, something like a military that, you know, establishes the rule of law that allow you to, you know, establish domain over your house, for example. Otherwise, you know, somebody might come and take it. And you know, we have police and, you know, military around our border so that people don't just come in and take it. And that is all sort of measured in energy. And that prevention of theft is a necessary component of ownership, right? Like uh, you're only as good at owning something as your ability to defend it from somebody else taking it or yeah. preventing theft. Exactly. What you're saying about Bitcoin is that it has the special property of making it much cheaper to prevent others from taking it. And that in turn means that you have way more cooperation and instead of people trying to take stuff. In the physical world, like the ability to take somebody's stuff, to steal it, to fight for it or do whatever is much cheaper. Like the defending is actually fairly expensive versus the value of it. So oftentimes, you know, people will come in and just take your stuff because it's cheaper for them to do that rather than produce it themselves. Instead, you have the opposite in Bitcoin where preventing that is relatively easy because it's electrical power projection and you can always do that. Whereas with, you know, physical stuff, it's not. Is that a way to look at the difference in, between Bitcoin and physical property? Oh, yeah. I think we're on to something here because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I learned this being the little brother, right? Like mm -hmm. my toys aren't my toys. My, you know, like my toys are only my toys insofar as I can prevent my stronger older brother from taking them, right? Like people think legal ownership represents like true ownership. No. No. Mm. Ownership is your ability to own anything insofar is true insofar as you can defend it from someone taking it from you. Mm. We use rule of law to kind of like prevent that as much as possible. But like, you know, I like, sorry, but someone can come in and shoot you in the heart and take your thing. It's not mm. your thing anymore as much as the rule of law says it's your thing. So, but the way to think about it is how expensive is it? How much energy does it take to prevent that person from coming in to shoot you? Or how much energy does it take to prevent the current strongest person who's setting the state and chain of custody from not abusing their power? Hmm. And that amount of energy has been increasing to now in like the point where it would destroy humanity if it ever had to be used. Mm. And so Bitcoin is extremely efficient at protecting people from abusive control structures using literally the same exact process, just way less energy. Mm. And so, you know, I, that like I drew my picture and I posted it to Twitter to kind of try to illustrate this, like the people don't know this, but like, you know, when you are 
if you think you own a house, like, first of all, you're effectively renting your house from the government. You don't actually own it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the taxes that you pay, part of those taxes go into defending that house against, you know, the Mongolian horde that could come in at any time and invade, right? Mm -hmm. Like you are constantly, you know, just like when you eat steak, you're outsourcing the killing of animals to someone else because it's a messy process and they could probably do it much more humanely than we could. Mm. Ditto for militaries. You're you're outsourcing the defense of whatever you think you own to your local military to prevent you know North Korea from claiming ownership over that thing. Mm. And so, but that is expensive. It takes so much energy to do that, especially for our monetizable property. Mm. Why? Like, why do we have to do it that way? We don't have to. There's nothing preventing us from changing the form of that energy projection protocol to something like Bitcoin, where like not only is it more efficient, it's actually, in my opinion, like I think something that more people would subscribe to on an ethical basis because mm. you don't have to nominate people to fight over whatever the legitimate state of rule of law or property ownership is anymore. You well, I guess you would still have to do it for some stuff, but not for money. Mm. And that's like, I think such a powerful idea. People get confused. They think about like Bitcoin and they think about blockchain or they think about, you know, time partitioned ledgers distributed around the world, right? Like mm -hmm. time partition chains of custody of some underlying asset. You can, that's like, not even close to what the complex emergent property, the primary value delivered function of Bitcoin. It's like saying, you know, the purpose of an hourglass is to store sand, to contain sand. <laughs> like, no, you know, the purpose of an hourglass transcends a glass container and sand. The purpose of an hourglass is to record and track the passage of time itself. The purpose of Bitcoin is way more than just to store energy or to partition the chain of custody of some underlying property across a distributed ledger. The primary value delivered function of Bitcoin is we've created a oppression proof control structure over a form of property that is quite literally immune to kinetic warfare mm. and quite literally immune to oppressive law. Mm. And like, you know, um, just imagine the type of things that humans could get done if we solved those hazards away. Like in, so I come from like a safety, I mm -hmm. did uh, launch mission assurance for rockets. Mm. There's a couple different ways you can protect yourself against the hazard. In this case, the hazard of oppression, the hazard against warfare, the hazard of whatever you can try to control it. You can try to reduce it. But the easiest and safest way to protect a system from any form of hazard is to just eliminate the capacity for the hazard altogether. Mm. Like you don't have to worry about war. Like you don't have mm. to like, and so far as your money, like you don't have to worry about, you know, some invader taking your money with Bitcoin. You don't have to worry about some oppressive law being passed. With Bitcoin, you completely eliminate the hazard altogether by literally replacing it, like by, mm. you know, what is effectively substitution. Like in the rocket business, there are some types of fuels that if you breathe them, you die instantly, like some oh, wow. agonizing, painful death. Mm. How do you protect yourself against that hazard? You don't use that fuel. You use some other fuel. You substitute it for something mm. else. Bitcoin is a substitute for a hazardous, you know, system, the mm. hazard being like kind of like satoshi would say like the hazard being eventually there's going to be some organization that abuses their control authority over money eventually there's going to be some larger military that will try to invade you if mm -hmm. you want to protect yourself against that if everyone wants to protect themselves against that those threats substitute their monetary property for something that isn't vulnerable to those threats mm -hmm. The main threats being something physical, essentially. If you have physical-based money, kind of like gold bars or something like that, that's 
something that will that is vulnerable to kinetic power, whereas with something like Bitcoin, it's not vulnerable to kinetic power. And I think what you're saying is that because of this property of defensibility around something that is essentially metaphysical, you have the ability to not have to spend so much on kinetic power projection in order to defend your property. You can you can essentially just keep it in this electrical form and you use that as your value. And if more people did that, then you get less kinetic power projection or less uh, resources spent on defense of physical property. And instead you get a lot more you know, productive stuff coming out of it. Is that an accurate summation? Yeah. Can, just consider the, the ROI. Just consider it as a pure mm. business scenario. Mm. Back in the champagne fairs of the you know medieval Europe, you would have pe- merchants creating whatever they were creating, nice new skin or something, right, to take mm-hmm. to the local fair to sell it. And on the way to the fair, they would get hit by pirates, right? They or, or you know like look at the pirates of the Caribbean, right? Like mm-hmm. it's profitable to take monetary property from people. And especially if they don't put up a fight, that's why we have Cal, remember? Mm. You know, we have Cal, we literally created a ox that doesn't put up a fight so that we can eat it. The ROI is a lot higher if they don't put up a fight. And so that means you have to spend resources, you have to create energy, you have to do a lot of work to put up a fight. But... If you use Bitcoin or if you use something like Bitcoin, you're still putting up a fight, right? Like these miners are constantly projecting power to make it too cost prohibitive to try to attack the network. That is a fight. They're preserving the trade routes of the internet, essentially. But like, imagine if everyone starts to take the monetizable value of their property and transpose it into Bitcoin all that's left in the physical kinetic domain is the utilitary value of stuff. Like, do you think people would be fighting over stuff if it had no monetary value whatsoever? Mm. Right. Would they only fight for utilitarian value? They might, but Mm -hmm. are they going to fight more? That's the cool thing to think about. Bitcoin is it essentially decouples. It rips the monetary value out of traditional property which is mm. what a lot of people are doing when they fight, right? They're trying to gain that monetary property or protect against people from trying to steal that monetary property. It rips that out of the kinetic domain altogether and parks it under a in a digital domain where all that kinetic power projection is useless. It mm. doesn't do anything for you. If you want to you know, get more Bitcoin, you have to mine it, which means you have to contribute to the security of the network and be subsidized by people. That's what we're doing when we are buying Bitcoin. We're effectively subsidizing the defense of Bitcoin. That's how, why miners exist. Mm. And like Michael Saylor eloquently said, now you don't own a spoil of war anymore. You own something that is immune to war. If you want more Bitcoin, you have to, like he said, you know, you got to negotiate for it. You got to mm. talk people out of it. You have to create a, you have to, exactly you have to cooperate you have to create a you have to create value right you have to create a good or service that people are wanting to exchange for their bitcoin and see it, it's not exactly voluntary right like mm-hmm. you know people aren't explicitly i mean some of us are who get it like i do this but mm-hmm. not a lot of people explicitly choose to you know defund or devalue kinetic power projection they're doing it because, you know, number go up or, or some other reason. Like we're beginning to cooperate together for reasons that no single human can really fully appreciate, just like back in the day, just like all successful predators that emerged. Mm. We're discovering something that works really well. And I think it will, I think what it's going to do is change civilization more than at least, you know, humans have ever seen it. Hmm. Well, I mean, this is 
fascinating, especially this point about having a control structure that's uh, that's very different than the the ones that are physical. Because for the ones that are physical, you you have, I think, as you described, that you have like an alpha male or something, and they basically have control over something and you end up trusting that alpha male or alpha animal or whatever. And that that's how we're kind of wired. Whereas with Bitcoin, you have a very different control structure that where oppression essentially isn't possible, where a strong controller can't just sort of take stuff away. And that is a lot better for cooperating in which ultimately built civilization it obviates the need for as much military spending as we have yeah animals animals use kinetic power projection humans are animals we did it too but we got mm. a little bit more clever and we at least created surrogate power projection mechanisms through rule of law but the problem is your rule of law is only as good as your military can defend that rule of law. So it's still effectively a kinetic power projection game. Mm -hmm. We scaled that projection game to the point where people who own nuclear weapons have unimpeachable control authority over resources. It's just simply too expensive to, to fight over them or to, to impeach the power of an oppressor if they emerge. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin fixes it. Bitcoin takes the exact same game, natura non facit saltis, nature does not make leaps, it takes the exact same function. As Breedlove would say, technology is non-biological evolution. We're evolving a new way to play this power projection game that is that transcends both military and the rule of law system where we just subscribe, we voluntarily subscribe to valuing a new form of money, right? Remember, money is just a shared abstraction network. Mm -hmm. It has value only insofar as humans choose it has value. Humans are beginning to nominate this new form of property as a money, not because it's digitally partitioned across a distributed ledger. That part to me is like super basic and super boring. The reason why it works so great as money is because it restores a permissionless control structure over the property that has otherwise disappeared because nuclear weapons have effectively prevented our ability to countervail or impeach the power of an oppressor if they should emerge. Mm. And now, as long as we maintain it, right? Like as long as we don't screw this up, then mm. like imagine the level of cooperation that we can achieve now. Everyone on the same money, no capacity to fight and win Bitcoin as a spoil of war. Mm. The only way to get more Bitcoin is to negotiate people out of it or to provide better goods and services. You're going to get a lot more goods and services. You're going to get a lot better negotiations. You're going to get you know, a lot less return on investment of the kinetic power projection game. You're going to like, you don't need to have massive militaries now at least in so far as you need to protect your monetary property. It just, every incentive aligns perfectly to where humans can cooperate without having to like the other person. Like, mm. you know, I'm the government guy walking into Bitcoin Twitter, right? Like mm. they're not, you know, a lot of Bitcoin Twitter people aren't going to like me, right? I'm the, I'm mm. the spook. I'm the, you know, military dude, but, but damn it. We like, we're cooperating, right? Because we're both advocating for the use of Bitcoin. Mm. Isn't that funny how that works? Like that's mm. what Bitcoin does. It creates these frenemies. Mm. Do that at the national scale level. Imagine what civilization could achieve. Bitcoin is the surrogate to war. It replaces war because it is war. People jump to like, you know, visions of horror, which, you know, I understand and is rightful. But like... If you look at just purely the function of war, not the form, not the not the bloody part, just the function of war, Bitcoin is the functional identical, is functionally identical. It is the surrogate to war. Let's use that. Humans, let's use that. Hmm. It's kind of what I want to try to capture in my thesis. And and then like I said before, it's not even a negotiation. We have to. Like if everyone chooses to use it, the government doesn't get to not vote. Or the hmm. doesn't the doesn't Oh, sorry, the 
the government doesn't get to vote. They can't vote. How do you vote? You know, actually they can vote. You know how you vote? Run a node, right? Mm. Like buy Bitcoin. Um, and so, gosh, like I'm so passionate about that because especially like this last year, people are so caught up in, in my opinion, like crap that doesn't matter, right? Like mm. <laughs> if I, you know, like they're looking at it, like I said before, they're looking at an hourglass and saying, wow, glass containers are so useful. We could store salt in them. We could store pickles in them. We could, you know, like they're talking about all the different use cases of a glass container without, while looking at an hourglass, totally missing the point, hmm. totally missing the, the value that this thing can bring. And I'm not saying like, you know, all coins are, won't provide value to our lives. They could, or crypto anything could probably do that but they're not going to provide the same value as an hourglass does mm. there's a very specific structure very specific form and it requires energy a lot of it but when you do it right you end war over money and that's mm. man that is like how could you not want that mm. Yeah, and there's there's a lot of resources that go into wars over money, and not just physical, but there are all sorts of shenanigans that central banks go into. But maybe that's a, a conversation for another day. I I do feel like I've taken so much of your time. This is at least according to my watch, something like two and a half hours worth of uh, content, probably the nice. longest one that I've ever done. So <laughs> like pretty crazy, but I could talk to you all day, but I do want to respect your time and maybe we'll continue this conversation as we, you know, as you develop some of your thesis and, uh, you know, get a little more into how you're going to make the argument to the space force that this Bitcoin is something that they should embrace. But before I let you go, where can people find you? Where can people learn more about you and all of your very, very interesting ideas. Yeah, I'm on, I created a Twitter. Greg Foss told me to set up a Twitter. And so I did. And I appreciate that. I was on LinkedIn for a while. Still am, but I like Twitter more. A lot better takes, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm still experimenting. I don't know exactly what structure this will take. So yeah, definitely for sure. We should talk again once I kind of have like matured my ideas a little bit more. Mm -hmm and learned more from the community. But yeah, for now I'm available on Twitter, Jason P. Lowry, just at Jason P. Lowry. This is my job. Like I'm literally being paid by the DOD to go to MIT to research these topics. Mm. So, you know, I don't like, I don't like monetize anything. This mm. is strictly just me kind of talking about what I'm doing and being fully transparent about it. So I would love to have people come in and kind of give me more feedback on my ideas as I mature them. And I very much appreciate these opportunities to talk to kind of the better subject matter experts like you to kind of like hash out my thoughts and maybe get some clarification on which direction I should be going. Well, it's definitely my pleasure to do all of that. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, Jimmy. Take care. Unchained Capital is a sponsor of this podcast. I'm an advisor to the company. I know the team well, and I'm excited for what they are building. If you need multi-sig, collaborative custody, or a Bitcoin native financial services partner, learn more at Unchained.com. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Bitcoin Fixes This. Jason Lowry can be found at at Jason P. Lowry on Twitter. Until next time, Fiat Belinda S.